Okay, well, welcome everyone. Uh, let's get started. Um, this is the monthly community meeting of the Transmark Foundation for March 2017. My name is Rudy Potenzo. I'd like to welcome you uh, to our call today. Today, our agenda, we're going to cover uh, a couple of things. As usual, we'll have a Transmark Foundation update by Keith Elliston, our CEO. We'll also do an update on the latest release uh, of the platform, version 16.2, uh, and an update on progress with 17.1. Our feature speaker today is Sasha Herziger from the University of Luxembourg, and he'll give us an update on the latest on the Smart R, which is included in the 16.2 update. So I'd like to turn it over to Keith to give us uh, the update on the foundation. Keith? Thanks, Rudy. Um, it's, uh, it's certainly been a very busy month uh, at the foundation. There's a, a lot of things that we're, we're focusing on, a lot of things that we're cleaning up. But Rudy, if you can uh, show the next slide. Uh, what I will do is, is uh, you know, Rudy can go through the uh, what we're doing with 16.2. I think the, the key elements that, that with 16.2 that I want to emphasize is that uh, the Postgres uh, version is, is out and released. Uh, the Oracle version is in testing, and that's just based upon having uh, sufficient uh, Oracle resources and people participating in that testing. And then uh, uh, there's about, I think, 130 data sets that have been released as part of that. They're all Transmart ready data sets. So uh, we're pretty happy with uh, with where 16.2 is. Lots of new technology, lots of new capabilities in there. Uh, with respect to 17.1, the Transmart uh, Pro Alliance uh, uh, work together. Uh, this is Pfizer, Sanofi, Roche, and, and AbbVie uh, working with the Hive as our development partner. Uh, to develop uh, the next version of 17.1. A lot of really interesting new technology in there that Rudy will take you through in terms of APIs and whatnot. Um, as we do with all of our developments, if you remember our roadmap, uh, we go uh, through a development cycle uh, and 17.1's development cycle is closing. Uh, that feeds into our release process. Um, so Rudy will tell you a bit about the PMC and how things are going there. Uh, there's been a, a lot of, uh, I've had a lot of questions from people around about this. Uh, one of the more important things about 17.1 is making sure that we get uh, everything uh, right. So making sure that we have uh, appropriate ETL and interface and other key elements of that, that's part of what will be uh, happening in the release process. Uh, the PMC will be working on that. Uh, we've also been putting uh, the project through our legal review process to make sure that we've got all the IP issues uh, with newly developed code all taken care of. Uh, the code it, it certainly will be available to people uh, as needed. Uh, this is not yet a release, but if people have a need to access pre-release code, want to do development on the code, uh, that's, that's something that uh, we strongly encourage. Uh, the PMC will be, uh, will be managing that process, uh, and if you're a participant in the PMC, you know, certainly you're involved in that governance. So uh, I think things are, are looking pretty good from that perspective. We're pretty happy with where things are. Uh, the release uh, schedule will be defined by the PMC uh, as it goes through that uh, once the project's closed. And uh, if our, I'm holding my fingers crossed that we'll get the project closed this week, uh, just cleaning up a few issues uh, on documentation of, of, of IP and licenses in the code. If anyone has any concerns on this, you know, I encourage you to contact me. Uh, I think this is in keeping with the roadmap that we, we've put out, um, and uh, certainly we don't see any challenges here, but if you have any questions or concerns, uh, contact me directly and happy to give you an update on that. Uh, really happy about uh, the, the relationship with IBM. We've just gotten our IBM Power 8 server installed. Uh, it's being hosted at the Michigan Institute for Data Sciences, MIDAS, uh, who are managing that system for us. Uh, it's an 82 processor, 3.5 terabyte RAM, uh, 4 server Power 8 system. <coughs> uh, this platform will be used for uh, Transmart development, uh, running Transmart on a high-end system on this, uh, of this nature, uh, and for various data science projects. Uh, so I encourage people that have uh, uh, interest in using the system or prototyping uh, codes on the system uh, to let us know. Uh, we certainly think this is going to be a great collaborative resource uh, for the foundation as we go forward. Uh, from a marketing uh, perspective, uh, I just want to highlight a couple things. One is that uh, we're continuing our, uh, our collaboration with the I2B2 Foundation. Uh, this will be the second year that we're co-hosting uh, the DBMI uh, uh, Harvard Medical School Precision Medicine meeting. This is uh, Zach Kahane's meeting. Uh, there's a big meeting on uh, June 21st, and on the 20th and 22nd, we'll be uh, co-hosting with the I2B2 Foundation, uh, you know, a key set of seminars and discussions as well as a user group meeting. 
Uh, so I encourage uh, people that have an interest in what we're doing with ITV2 to attend that. Uh, again, June 20th to 22nd, mark your calendars. Um, we also will be uh, working at uh, having a booth at BioIT World. We're going to give you the details, uh, but we'll be continuing our tradition of, of hosting a number of events at BioIT World. Uh, we are currently working on uh, the arrangements for the Foundation Annual Meeting, uh, which this year will be rotating to Europe, and, and Rudy can talk to you about details there. Um, in addition, uh, there's been a lot of uh, uh, questions that I've received. I'm certainly happy to address any of those about our, our ongoing relationship with ITB2 and ITB2 Foundation. Uh, what I can tell you is that things are, are going very well. We've got a, a great uh, working relationship there, and uh, you know we hope to have some more news about uh, continuing that relationship in, in a deeper and more meaningful way as we go forward. Uh, so I think there's a lot of things uh, going on. Uh, I think we're going to get the 17-1 development project buttoned up in the next week. Uh, the PMC is is organizing and, and coming together to manage that release process. We'll have a schedule out on that. Uh, we're looking for a lot of uptake on 16.2 with the Smart R. I'm really excited to have Sasha take us through that. Uh, I was sitting in a discussion uh, last summer at BioIT World, uh, last spring at BioIT World, uh, with a couple of translational scientists, and when they saw Smart R, they said, I really want to work with Transmart at this point. So I think this is a, a really foundational piece. Uh, I hope it's going to get a lot of uptake, and, and uh, we're certainly pretty excited about that. Uh, I see the 17.1 is really being, you know, a, a lot of work done on the, on the core of, of Transmart and making that more scalable, more reliable, more capable, uh, and enabling a plug-in infrastructure. So we're pretty excited about that coming along uh, as well, and making sure we keep the kind of capabilities that we brought into 16.2 with Smart R. Uh, with high dome, with the GWAS elements, and more uh, intact. So, uh, any questions? Again, please let us know. Uh, well, but I think there's a, a lot of a lot of good things happening, <coughs> and I will turn it over to to Rudy uh, to take us through the rest, and then look forward to Sasha's presentation. Great, thank you, Keith. Uh, just a couple of notes on on this slide um, for the medicine and the the joint meeting at Harvard Medical School. Um, the registration sites are open there, and you can find information on our website. Uh, at BioIT World, we will have a booth, but we're also working on a Wednesday evening event, as we usually do. Uh, and that's, um, that's something also to look forward to, and I will have uh, more details on the website shortly. Um, so I will move ahead. Uh, first, I want to talk just briefly about 16.2. Um, as hopefully you know, there, there's a lot of very important features um, that have come into the into the program uh, as uh, part of the, the release, Smart R, we'll hear a lot more about in a minute. That includes uh, an Ingenuity IPA uh, connector, um, XNAP imaging platform. We have uh, two different interfaces that give different capabilities um, that are also quite interesting. Uh, extensions to their GWAS, um, both from Pfizer and from Clarivate. J&J um, has contributed their high dome um, genomics uh, extensions. Uh, and also we brought back Metacore and Genome Browser and a number of ETL improvements. There's a lot of information on the website. We gave some extensive demos and discussions at our annual meeting, all of which are up on the, the website, both recordings of the presentations and the slide decks. And so there's a lot of information there if you want to learn more about in specific details. Um, we did release in February the Postgres version uh, of the platform. And I'm happy to say there really have not been a lot of significant defects reported since. It's always something as a developer you are concerned about. And um, so we've been quite happy um, with the, the process and <clears throat> where we are with that. Um, the Oracle version is now ready for testing and available today. Um, if you have questions, you can check with Peter Rice. But on the wiki, you will find uh, under the release, uh, uh, different releases, the Oracle test version. Uh, the, that's the address there on the screen. I guess I know it says Postgres. That's a, an artifact of some of the naming that we use for the, um, for the different servers, but that actually will get you to the Oracle version of the system. Um, it is ready and we encourage, you know, anyone who has, um, interest to, um, please, uh, to try it out. Um, if you need some help or have some questions, please let us know. Um, the other note about 16.2, we will also be releasing an IBM Power 8 version um, over the next couple of weeks, uh, and uh, that will also be another version of the platform that will be available, and we expect to, to be able to um, you know, have a lot more information about that in the, the coming weeks. 
So it's uh, there's some exciting progress there. Uh, on 17.1, I'm not going to talk a lot about the, um, the the platform. There's a lot of information, again, at the annual meeting recordings, and we will hold um, probably in two months, probably in the uh, May community meeting, uh, we'll look to do a lot more detail on some of the, the features in 17.1 uh, as a, an overview and then go into some of the specifics uh, in coming upcoming meetings. Uh, so that will be uh, coming up. Um, we are uh, about to receive the apps, the final code from the Hive uh, and uh, the PMC is being organized and we'll start working through this. So there'll be a lot more information in terms of schedule and specifics um, as we get uh, get through this. If you have questions or, or have interest here, um, please you know, don't hesitate to ask, you know, and uh, we'll, we'll try to provide you with uh, any information we can. Uh, and again, there's a lot of detail uh, available uh, on the website. So um, please, um, you know, hopefully if, if you have some interest here, you can, you can get more information uh, and please uh, don't hesitate to ask. <clears throat> uh, the intention is to have a complete release of 17.2 with all 17.1 with all of the versions and all the different capabilities of 16.2 plus all the new enhancements that have been brought in uh, to the platform uh, as a result of the project and so you know we end up with um, you know when we're done with this process and, and, and it will take a couple of months you know most likely um, but a, a very you know improved and, and much more powerful uh, platform um, for you so you know stay tuned So now um, what I'd like to do is, is introduce Sasha Herzinger from the University of Luxembourg, uh, who is going to talk about uh, SmartR, which has, you know, we've talked about it a number of times at these meetings, I know, and um, now it's it's released in the official version of the platform, uh, and we're really excited to um, to be able to talk about, you know, what's actually in the, the release and um, including some, some new things. So just give me a second here, I will get Sasha online. Okay, Sasha, you should have control now. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, great. Uh, so, uh, as always, a little disclaimer for my presentations. Uh, you know that I usually uh, present things live, so things might get uh, terribly wrong, but I will try my best, and usually it works quite well. Um, so quite a bit happened recently. Um, I'm not exactly sure which uh, workflows are available in 16.2 because there is different versions of Smarter. I believe it's these five. So what what you should know already that's uh, box plot, uh, correlation workflow, the heat map workflow, the IPA connector, and the volcano plots. Right? Should be roughly it, I think. Um, but what you see here is, is uh, the current development version. So there is five new workflows that um, I would like to talk about today. Um, the first one is the line graph. Um, I think a couple of you have seen this already in some other presentations. Um, but this is, I think, not included in 16.2 yet. So, so I will give, a, uh, will give a quick demo to this workflow. Uh, you should be able to see my browser now, right? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. So, um, when when you've worked with time series data, you should be um, you should know already this kind of curation. So, um, you you would encode uh, maybe not this one. Uh, you would have some kind of uh, numerical variable called HB or VB or something like this, and the visits themselves they are encoded into the tree nodes. So what I will do now is um, I will just define my cohorts. So let's say I want male versus female. That's 70. Less than 70. Go to the line graph. Um, so what you would usually do is you would you would just track you know a couple of numerical 
uh, values into the line graph. Because, right, what else would you want to display besides numerical values? Or maybe some high dimensional one. Not in this case now, but load it. It will visualize it. Um, so, what you can see here is um, the visits plotted uh, against, or um, the values, the numerical values plotted against time. Um, so for each uh, value, or for each pair, like HB, VB, or that can be things like blood pressure or heart rate or something like this, you will get one separate plot. Um, and when you go, for example, over the uh, visits, you see some summary. So there is a top couple of uh, hovering features, like when you go over here, you see um, here you see, for example, cohort two for numeric HB. Um, but you can also go over the line itself and you will see values like the standard deviation and the mean. Um, so what these things are, that's basically just box plots, right? So but what you can do is you can say, I want not the mean with the standard deviation. I want, for example, the median with the standard deviation. And you, you see that the numerical values I hope the animation is somehow visible and it's not too laggy. Um, but you should be able to see how these um, box plot-like things adapt to whatever I select here. So this is not real data. So if I press show individuals, you will see um, it will basically dissolve this grouping and you will see the real values. And what you can basically see is you see nothing because these are really just random data. So I can show you something. And of course, here you can also check the standard deviation and the mean of the values and something like that. Uh, what's also quite interesting is that um, usually um, these, um, at least as of now, there is no concept of time in Transmart. So what can sometimes happen is that um, when you create your data in such a way, um, your nodes will not be ordered. You could have, for example, a baseline, visit one, visit two, event one, event two, and you will have the wrong order here. So, um, and I think this in a very, very early prototype, a long time ago, I was presenting this already. So what you can do is you can shift your time points around and the plot will just adapt. And there are also a couple of other things like you can even space the time points in case you have, uh, so you don't see this now, but if you have like uh, visit one or week one, week two, week 10, week 20, you will not lose, uh, you will not lose uh, relativity. So week one and two are a lot closer to each other than 10 and 20 would be. Uh, and you have here the option to even in spaces. Now what's special about this workflow is that it can handle a completely different type of data. Um, there is not on, you cannot only plot uh, numerical values against time, but you have also maybe categorical events. So um, instead of, for example, blood pressure and, uh, you know, things that people plot, you could also say I have uh, medication taken on visit one, medication taken on visit two, uh, I had a headache on day five, um, I vomited on day 10. Uh, I had a high blood pressure on this day, you know, but not as a numerical value, as a categorical event in time. So what you can see here now is we have, uh, instead of these numerical notes, we have these categorical ones, just called A, B, C, D. So I will track a couple of them in here now. Fetch my data again. Go to the run analysis. Um, and what you see now is, um, you s maybe I should explain what, what you see. So these colorful points that you see are um, the events themselves. So you see here the legend on the right, you have A, B, C, D, E. And each of them gets assigned a, a unique uh, color form combination. Each of these bars represents a single patient. And then just, um, so 
for example, what you see here is set on visit one or baseline, A happened to this patient. And these four things happened on visit two. And these four things happened on visit three. Um, now, initially, these patients, of course, you don't want to display all, I don't know, 1,000 patients. So you, you need some kind of ranking. What you see here is this screen bar is um, that these patients, that they are ranked. Um, initially, they are ranked by their uh, inverse frequency. So it's, of course, a lot more interesting to have, um, to have the events which don't happen so often, but are still in your, in your analysis, right? Because that could be things like death or really severe events that don't happen so often, but are really, really interested. Now, of course, I cannot, um, you cannot assume this always. So what you could also do is you could, um, say that I want to wait them myself now. So just click this button and then you are able to track this legend. And what you see, while I'm tracking this legend, the weighting of the points changes. Um, and of course, also the weight of the, or the, the ranking of the patient changes. Now, what's the most interesting feature on this workflow is that usually you would like to know, um, for example, you would like to know if a patient took a truck on a certain date. Will he have any CV or will he have any events uh, like like headache or, or death or something like this uh, later in time? Or the other way around, are patients who have uh, who had a headache, did something happen before this time that caused this? So what you can do in this workflow is you can click an arbitrary point like maybe this, and you will see a couple of um, white dots appearing now. Ah, this is a nice one. You will see a couple of white points appearing in each row. What this represents is the dependent probability of one event happening given another event in time. So you see one row, this one, which is um, kind of highlighted. And you see that I was pressing the purple uh, triangle. That means, and what I did now is for every other event, at every other time point, I computed the dependent probability of, for example, red or, or category D happening at baseline, given that E happened at week 14. And what we see here now, for example, is that we have, um, and, and the size of these circles represents the, uh, how uh, high this probability is. So we see, for example, that we have a, a pretty high chance of uh, E happening at week 16 if E happened already at week 14. So this is probably the, the most interesting feature in this workflow because it kind of allows you to, to get an overview of, of um, uh, event, uh, time zero, uh, uh, categoric events uh, over time. So let's go to the next workflow, I would say. Um, this is a uh, locket workflow or the lo logistic regression. Hey, so just a quick note, the, uh, that the line plot is part of the 16.2 release. So they didn't make it in. Ah, it's already in there. Yep. Okay. okay. Sorry about this. It's just, you know, there is a couple of different versions and uh, I kind of lost the overview. Uh, okay, so, um, well, now you know how it works. <laughs> um, so, but I'm pretty sure that logistic regression is a new one. Yeah, and, and I'm not sure we've actually demoed it before, so I think it's great to have this. Keep going. Yeah, sure. Um, so the logistic regression workflow is, yes. And just a quick demo. I mean, um, this is actually in development right now, so it's not too fancy. But what it does is essentially uh, logistic regression. You have a couple of um, possibilities to uh, transform your x-axis and your y-axis. You get a couple of statistics here on the right side. 
like divines, residual range, and things like this. And like you uh, know, f or as you know from the correlation analysis, when you uh, select the data points, this logaristic regression is recomputed. And of course, uh, again, these whole features and uh, the histogram-like thing on the side. But besides this, there isn't too much to say about this workflow, given that you know already how the correlation workflow works. Um, this is a quite interesting tool, which I won't be able to demo because for this I would need uh, a special data set, data set which is not open. So uh, maybe I can explain what this does. Maybe you have seen already a couple of times that there is data sets in Transmart. Um, maybe I should go before this even. So in the I2B2 tree you have no way of defining um, single patients. Now what you could do is, um, at least what we do is, you have categoric uh, nodes and you could assign each of that node a single patient. So you would like collapse one of the folders and you would maybe see 200 nodes for 200 patients. Uh, why would you do this? So um, when you have Xenograph experiments, like um, you have the same set of patients but in different studies, you would want to um, define your cohorts, do some analysis, and then you would like to have exactly the same set of patients into the other study. So what this workflow would do for you is, um, assuming you have the data created in such a way, you would be able to track all of the patients here. You would go in another study, you would track all of the patients here, then you would fetch the data and build a new cohort. And it, what this does is it essentially takes your current cohort, downloads the data on the left side, and builds a new cohort based on the data on the right side. And then you can, so we, we tried this already and it works and we're using it already in a couple of projects or in one project at least. And um, you would, for example, define like uh, male versus female patients. Then you would go here, map the patients into the, uh, uh, into the other study. You would rebuild your uh, cohort and then you would, for example, go back into the heat map workflow where you would have exactly this set of patients just for the other study. But as, so it's not, too, there is not any, uh, there's no animations involved, so I guess explaining it is fine, even if I can't show it. Um, then you have, uh, then we have um, a workflow which has been contributed by the Friedrich Alexander University of, uh, from uh, Christian Nelmeli. So if you have any questions concerning this workflow, here's an email that uh, he will be able to most likely answer your questions. So sadly, I couldn't reach him, which is why I have to present you this workflow today. Um, so, survival workflow. Oh, and by the way, um, when you see here, this is the next workflow. Um, this is actually pretty big, so if you're on board, stay on the line. Things are getting really interesting in a moment, even if I can't show too much about that yet. Um, so this is a pretty normal survival analysis. You would define a, num a numerical value um, for, for the time. And then you would go into cancer stage and maybe tumor stages or node stages, drag them here. You would fetch your data, go here. Now you have a couple of um, variables, uh, like where should your legend be and things like that. But for now, we will just create the plot. And what you see here is, uh, I guess, pretty much a textbook uh, survival analysis. You, um, you know, you can hover the lines. You see, uh, maybe we can take this plot out here. There. Um, you see for each time point, uh, the the patients 
that uh, or the number of uh, patients that are in it, I guess. So, and you see a couple of statistics below. Um, as I said, this is not my workflow. This was uh, contributed, and I'm really happy about that. Other people are, are developing for for this framework, so it makes me quite happy. Um, I guess I can't say too much about it. It's in survival analysis. I guess clinicians know low, not better how to use this than I do. Um, and now to the to the last thing I want to show. Uh, that's a variant map. Now this is something pretty special because, uh, as the name suggests, we are analyzing um, variant data now. Um, I will, I will only demonstrate it to a certain point. So what you would usually do is you would define a high dimensional uh, data, like you would um, uh, maybe a couple of teams, TB, TB, this one, and you would define a couple, a couple of numerical, uh, categorical nodes, a couple of numerical ones, and maybe a couple of more genes. Uh, yeah. And then you have this field here. And this is actually where things get really special. Um, you might know that um, at this point, uh, the, um, we have no good way of storing variant data or querying them fast. So what we are doing right now at University of Luxembourg is we're developing um, something called variant DB, uh, which is able to store variant data and query them really, really fast. Like you can have a couple of hundred patients and you can uh, query, I think, uh, a couple of hundred genes within seconds. And this is essentially what happens now. So when I press fetch data, I get data from two different sources. I will get the high dimensional data, the numerical data, and the category, categorical data from Smart. And I will get from the URL that I, um, that I specify here, I would get the variance for the patient IDs um, that my two subsets represent. And then it would combine everything into some kind of map. Now, little disclaimer, this work, what I'm showing you now, is heavily uh, oriented on CBioPortal. So maybe a couple of you guys are familiar with this. What you see here is um, you have on your x-axis essentially the subjects. And on your y-axis, you have uh, genes. So this variant map is gene-centric. You can have multiple variants, of course, per gene. Um, so I will explain you what you see now. Um, this blue field means that at least one variant within that gene has been not synonymous. Please don't mix this up with non-synonymous. It's uh, everything but synonymous. Um, so there is already some chance for, for some potential damage. Uh, as I said, I'm also taking data from uh, transmit here. So you could define uh, a threshold, like maybe two. And if you have a set of score for your expression data over two, you would get this red circle here. If it's under two, you would, uh, under minus two, then you would have that green circle. Um, then you see a couple of green, sometimes yellow, and rarely red points within each of these fields. This is, um, this is based on uh, uh, a database that, is, that you can load into R, which gives you the probability of at least one, one variant damaging your protein uh, low, medium, or high. So no, actually it's the other way around. Like the chance of damaging the protein is low, medium, or high. So, for example, this is pretty bad because uh, you would most likely investigate this because there is a really high chance that it damaged the, uh, the protein function. On top, you see the numerical data. So that can be things like age or really whatever whatever you want. And you have the categorical data. So each, of, each line is essentially um, one 
categorical node and it's blue if the category is present and otherwise it's white. Um, this workflow will probably not be available in actually I don't know when 17.1 is released. A colleague of mine is developing variant DB and as soon as we can uh, we can uh, make a package of it and easy to install it we will propose this as a, as a solution uh, from us uh, for variant data in Transmart. But uh, there is still some way to go, which is one of the reasons why I'm not presenting this today here. Uh, well, at least not live. Um, and that's pretty much it. So uh, initially I saw the IPA connector is not in it, which is why you still see the special thanks to uh, Nils Christian for the IPA connector. But um, special thanks to um, Christian Nell for his workflow. I'm really happy that other people are developing for, for this framework. And of course, uh, I would like to thank the Sanofi team because they're doing a lot of beta testing for me and uh, they are catching a good part of the bugs be before it's released into the public. Um, yeah, and that's pretty much it. Thank you. Thank if you. any questions, just shoot. Yeah, thanks, Sasha. That's great. Um, it's good to see others developing on the platform. I agree, but it's also good to see you're still developing. So that's, that's super. Um, so, okay, we can open up for questions for Sasha now, specifically, and then we'll open up in general. Uh, if you have a question, you can raise your hand and I'll unmute you. You could type it into the question window or into the chat window. I'm watching all of those. So if anyone has a question for Sasha. I see one question, or is it one hand raised? There it is. Denny. Okay, Denny, you're unmuted. Go ahead. Hi, all. Hi, Sasha. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, okay. good. Uh, so, yeah, so this is this is looking very nice, Sasha. Thank you for, for the presentation. So, uh, what I wanted to ask you was about the uh, variant map. Um, so, what type of, of or, or how, um, with with what type of, uh, of of ETL is is this data loaded? Is this with the uh, is this loaded with uh, VCF uh, schema or or is it loaded with something else? Um, so as I said, I'm not developing this and I'm not too involved in okay. it. Besides besides being a customer of it, um, mm -hmm. but for my understanding is yes, you drop a VCF file and it's loaded via a script that is provided together with it. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, we have a question typed in from Natalia. Should the box plot work yes. with high dimensional data? Ah, yes. Uh, I'm. See, this is again another thing. I'm not sure if this is 16.2 or not. Um, so, can you still see my screen? Uh, yes. Ah, okay. So, I can actually go back here. Um, as I said, I have so many versions now, I don't know which is available to the people and which not. Um, so you could uh, say TP63, hoping that these genes are available in here, and you would define maybe a couple of uh, America variables, and this should work. Hopefully, I haven't tested this before the demo. Yeah. And you see here, you have uh, your survival. No, wait a second. Ah, here. Yeah. So there is only. No, that's exactly it. So here you see that we have uh, nothing for TP63, uh, but we have uh, data for MX1. So yes, it supports. Uh, it supports high dimensional data now. You have also the possibility of um, of grouping them. So you have this new field, I'm, as I said, I'm not sure what of this available already and what not. Okay, I'm not. Go back. Um, and you would see that this node is splitted into um, 
into by subset and by whatever you tracked into this box. So we see for subset one, we see one uh, for each of the categories I was just dragging into here. So I hope that answers the question. Yeah, what I'm hearing from Natalia is that the um, it, it is not available in either line graph or box plot. So maybe we need to do an up update uh, of the latest version. Um, we are uh, we do have available the opportunity to do um, uh, a relatively easy, hopefully, uh, update. So you know, just by replacing the WAR file. So we'll uh, we'll take a look at that and talk with you directly, Sasha. Try to get the sure. I mean, this is a pretty good moment to talk about this, even because I will have to prepare quite soon a version for for e tricks again. So yeah. maybe I can make just one for both, yeah. like this kind of a line. That, you know, well, I'm sure Peter Rice and I will be in touch shortly. Okay, thank you. Um, let me open up any other questions about anything about the foundation, anything we talked about earlier, or other topics. Again, raise your hand electronically or type in a question. Not, not seeing anything so far. Okay, well maybe, maybe we've answered everything. All right, well, I guess we'll bring the meeting to a close. Uh, again, I wanna thank everyone for, um, for joining us today. Um, Certainly, if you haven't checked out 16.2, it is available. Uh, it includes the uh, install script uh, is there for the uh, Postgres version. Uh, the Oracle version is available for testing. If you have interest uh, and would like to help us out and do some testing over the next week or so, please um, you know, go to the wiki page and it gives you all the details that I had on my slide, um, but also can, um, uh, you know, you'll be able to, to get the information from the slide deck here. Um, and uh, otherwise, again, thanks everyone, and um, join us again next month. Thank you very much.